Hi, I'm Steph Lee, the founder of Host Agency Reviews and your host for today's show, Travel Agent Chatter. Thanks so much for joining us on YouTube. Go ahead and make sure to subscribe to our channel, which I think is located here. I don't know. If I got that right, you should go ahead and give this a like because it's incredibly hard to figure out where to point when you can't see anything. But anyhow, um, go ahead and subscribe to the channel so you never miss another Travel Agent Chatter episode. And you'll also get a lot of free resources and videos that we push out throughout the year. Na, 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 na. Travel Agent Chatter, Volume 17. Travel Agent Chatter is an audio series produced by the team here at Host Agency Reviews roughly every quarter. Today we're picking the brain of a self-described airfare consultant who charges between $60 to $500 per ticket, as well as has a handful of his clients on retainer. You'll learn how he does it, why he does it, and some cool tips and tricks to apply to your agency. Before we jump into the show, a few updates. First off, thank you for filling out our travel agent income survey uh, that we talked about in the last episode. I'm thrilled to say that the HAR team has been busy crunching data and the 2020 hosted travel agent income report is live on the site. We'll be pushing out more reports soon covering independent advisors, income, travel agent employee salaries and benefits, and a report on the income and startup costs for new advisors. And you can always find all of HAR's reports by visiting our blog and selecting travel agent sur surveys from the tags drop down. And one last shout out before we get started. I'm thrilled to say we reached our goal for 2020 campaign. That's right, we hit 20 new reviews in 2020, so thank you for all your help. And I think I've kept you waiting long enough, haven't I? Let's get on to the show. All right. Well, me oh my, boy, do we ever have a fun show for you today. Um, and we, as an industry, totally need a fun and inspiring show to add a little sunshine to the horrific year of 2020 that all of us want to see in our rearview mirror. Um, so Larry Neron is living proof that you can make money in airfare. Uh, we'll be talking today about how he built up his business and how you can build your air sales um, and increase them and be more confident in booking your air. We'll give like a lot of hands-on tips for you. I just wanna remind everybody, there's plenty of ways to digest our podcast. So we have the video, which is on our YouTube page uh, for host agency reviews. We have the transcript at hostagencyreviews.com slash TAC. And of course, you can also listen it and stream it on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, Let's see, so today's schedule, we'll be breaking it into five different segments. The first will be beginnings. Uh, next up will be all things fees. Uh, we'll talk about Larry's booking process. And then the last one is my catch-all bucket. It's all other things. So, and then we'll finish it with our warm, fuzzy segment. So let's get this show on the road. Larry, welcome to Travel Agent Chatter. Hey, thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Yeah, well, I, I want to paint a little picture of Larry for you because he's Canadian. Uh, so between Larry and me, maybe hearing some really long O's in our northern accents as they come out. Uh, and, and Larry, you're actually, I don't know if you know this, you're really lucky that you're based out of Canada because when people ask you where you're from, like Minnesota is just horrible because you have such a long O in it. And so they're like, oh, Minnesota. And you're like, so I try to say it like as fast as I can. I'll be like, Minnesota. <laughs> and hope yeah. that my O's don't show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, my first language is French, so I do have a mix of, yeah, Canadian and French in there. So a bit of a bag. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I'm so excited to have you on today because I have to tell you, airfare is not really my strong suit. Uh, but you're one of the biggest aviation geeks I've met, and I love your passion for it. <laughs> Um, uh, so Larry's from Canada, as we said, um, he loves road biking and your agency isn't quite, I wouldn't call it home based. What would you call it, Larry? Like RV based? I uh, pretty much. Yeah. It's, uh, it's based out of my RV and I usually travel around North America depending on the weather. So I spend my time between Canada, the U S Mexico. So wherever the sun goes, I go. 
Yeah, or depending on infectious diseases, because now you're kind of trapped up there, right? That's right. <laughs> well, so Larry's been kicking around the industry for about 15 years, um, seven of it as a travel advisor. Um, and he was also with WestJet for a little bit doing some travel industry things. So while we're, well, when we were talking earlier, one of my favorite moments uh, was when you casually mentioned as if this was completely normal that you played an airline simulation game for fun. And when you, when you first mentioned it, I thought you were like, um, you know, pretending to pilot a plane or something and you got points for good landings. Uh, but it turns out like the game is actually simulating running an airline. So I'd like you to kind of tell us, um, because I know I'm not the only one wondering this, how in the world did playing that, simulation game get you into WestJet's pricing department, like air pricing department without any qualifications? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I got hired, first of all, at WestJet because I was bilingual, French and English. So my first job was a super sale agent on the phone in a call center. And I spent about six months there, which was the minimum time we had to do before we can move to another job. And then I moved to the groups department after that. And throughout these in a bit years, I was playing this airline game called Airline Simulation online, all the time, on the weekend, geeking out about building an airline with my own schedule, my own fees, buying my planes and managing the money and this money as well. And um, one day a position came up with the pricing department as a coordinator position. And like us, we read descriptions of, you know, job postings and I always feel like you're not qualified to do it or you're missing a bunch of stuff. And uh, one of my team leaders at the time said, you should just go shadow, just go see what they do. And I booked some time, I went there. And uh, when I saw exactly what they did, which, which was they just managed the airline and all their pricing sheets were in Excel, exactly what I was doing with my fake airline, which I don't even recall what the name of it was then. I was gonna ask. <laughs> um, I don't recall, I think I, I, I think I probably had like, some Canada in it, Air Canada like was Lair taken, Air. obviously. Lair Air, I like <laughs> that. That would have been a good one. Um, and then I, you know, and then when I saw that, I applied for the job and I got an interview and then I shot the interview with uh, my fake airlines uh, papers and all my spreadsheets printed and my schedules and my pricing, everything, and <laughs> saying, listen, you guys do this for real and I do it for fun. So I'm pretty sure I could, be, I'm pretty sure I could do this. And then that got me uh, a foot in the door to the pricing and the revenue management team at Washington at the time. So, so you did that for like seven years, is that right? Six and a half years apartment altogether, yeah. Okay. And that was nine years of shit altogether. And then after WestJet, you decided that you wanted to be on the advisor side of things. So tell us a little bit about your next stint and how that gave you, it was kind of like a step a stepping stone to starting your own agency. So what happened there? Where were you at and what happened? Yeah, at the end of after six and a half years, like I'd done pretty much all the jobs I could do in the, in the revenue management department and it was fun and I just didn't want to feel it was no longer fun for me to leave. And at the same time, I was doing some personal development work on the side and came the topic of passion and questioning what I was doing. And I realized that I like helping people fly, right? So long I'd been booking tickets for my parents, my brother, my sister, friends, families, like everybody who needed to fly, like I was always the go-to person to book it. And so I wanted to jump the fence, take all that knowledge I'd gotten from the airline and get over to the consumer side and make them uh, benefit from all that information that I've learned. So I went on doing that. I quit WestJet um, on the spot and I took the summer off and I could build a business and, you know, building a business and all that kind of stuff. And I said, maybe it's just easier if I just get a job. And I applied for a flight center, a travel agency in Canada and retail mall. And I got hired right away. I had some qualifications, right? Got trained up and I spent 10 months uh, doing uh, retail travel agency with a uniform, you know, and got a taste of that. It's my favorite. I don't even know what the <laughs> flight center uniforms look like, but I love that they have them. <laughs> Uh, we had a tie. We had a tie. Uh, I, I didn't even know how to do a, like do up a tie. Oh, it's not clip-on. So. It's a real one. It was a real one. Yeah, Super they fans. gave us a real one. <laughs> so that was that was that was fun. But uh, after ten months, I realized that you know I was going in the right direction, meaning that I was doing what I really wanted to do. But it, the way that they were doing it, I just didn't want to do it the same way. And that's what got me to quit Flight Center and start on my own as an independent travel agent 
on January 2014, right off the bat, without any experience or any clients or book of business. Mm -hmm. And it was the um, kind of the idea that they weren't transparent with the fees that was kind of trouble troubling for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it was, you know, the fact that everything was very on a transaction for transaction level, like every time you sold something, you needed to make sure you extract as much money as you possibly could for that client, as opposed to just build a relationship for the long term and that will benefit both people in the end. And, but it was always numbers, 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 and we need to race. And I didn't feel confident, you know, like charging more than what it was in case somebody noticed. And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, like now all of a sudden your credibility just goes down the drain and then you can lose a bunch of clients, a lot of clients do it. And I just didn't want to do that. Like, I just wanted to charge fees for what I did. And I just wanted people to know I wanted to have my name at the bottom with the fee associated with it is how kind of it started. And then later on through listening to other people, I became a fee. And that's how I decided to start on my own. And right off the bat, I started charging fees. Well, well, that's the perfect transition to our next section, which is all things fees. Um, So fees are such a hot topic right now in the industry with COVID creating this huge push for travel advisors to start charging fees for their services. Um, Everywhere you look, there's an article or a webinar on fees. And we we just recently did a fee trend webinar on how COVID's kind of changing things. And that's, Larry reached out to me after that. Um, I was on there. Yeah. And it, it's pretty fun. I even pull out my trumpet for it. So I will put a link in the show notes um, for people that want to watch the fee trend slash uh, trumpet recital webinar that we put on. So um, let's see. So you had written in and you had shared with me how you only sell air and that 85% of your income comes from ticketing fees um, and that 15% is from the air commissions. So your ticket fees range from 60 to 500 Canadian US dollars, right? Yeah, so for international travel, if you want to keep it full, it starts at 165 and it goes up to 425. Yeah, and then okay. domestic stuff, it's a little less, but I raise the fees all the time because I just want to do less of those, but the international is where what I do most and uh, and mostly in the premium cabins as well. So, uh, so that's why I still have 15% commission because there's still good commissions made when you book a uh, premium cabin and business class most of the time. Mm-hmm. And, and to give everyone an idea um, of how much air Larry is booking. So he booked uh, 775,000 um, in air only in 2019. So I think for a lot of people, it might be easy to think like, oh, it's, easy for Larry to become an airfare expert and to charge those fees because he has the background of the inner working of the airlines, but I don't have that experience. But your philosophy is that it's not so much about what you know, but it's about the services that you're providing. So what do you, what do you mean by that? Can you explain that a little more? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when people ask me, like when I tried to explain what I do and it took me years to nail it down and I still don't have it nailed down exactly what I, I have do. the same people problem. Like, <laughs> people always come back to, so you're a travel agent. I'm like, yes! well, essentially what I say now is like, well, I have a service, I have a service company and I happen to have an expertise in airfare. But primarily why people come to me is for just peace of mind. It's all about service. Um, yeah, I do have an advantage in a sense where I know some uh, airfare stuff that gives me an edge that way. But that's not, people don't come because I save them money right? Like that's the byproduct of working with me is like we end up by saving money because I know a little more because I happen to work in the airline industry and in the heart of the airline with the revenue management team and the pricing. But primarily it's peace of mind. I just, you know, like I, I, you know, I work primarily like my prime client is a person who spends their entire life um, exchanging uh, time for money. And now they're in a position to exchange me for time, right? So now they pay me and whatever hassle I can take off their plate. Um, and really all I do with the piece is I just try to make sure the idea is as seamless and stress-free as possible. I'm, um, I try to, um, I'm proactive as opposed to reactive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I track all the flights from my clients. I make sure they, um, you know, the flights connect. If the flight doesn't arrive on time as delay, then I send them a quick message. And this tool started as when I first started, I still did not want a client to call me at three in the morning 
And for them to tell me that their flight was canceled, I always wanted to know before they did. So I started sending all these alerts to warn me if things were going to go off the rails. And I found out by accident that, you know, by getting that email automatically, and I'm like, oh, flight's delayed. I get on my phone and I send a client a, a message to my client saying, are you still at the line? Like, yeah, I'm just about to leave for the gate. And I text him back and I said, listen, your flight's delayed 20 minutes. Have another cocktail or something. And then all of a sudden, like, it turns into, like, telling to his buddies, like, hey, your flight's delayed. And he's like, well, how do you know? Well, my travel guy sent it to me. And this little thing made the world of a difference to these people. Like, it just reinforced that somebody was flying with them, had their backs. And uh, it turned into a great value tool, like a service tool that translated into huge value in terms of pricing my client. And which, in essence, uh, time-wise, it takes literally no time, but I can extract a lot of value out of that. So when we talk about fees, specifically in my business, I don't tend to price fees based on how much time it's me to to do the, the, the job or the task. I price my, my services based on um, how my client would perceive the value of what I deliver. So it has nothing to do with what I believe it's worth because I'd never pay $1,000 for a business class ticket to go to London, right? But mm-hmm. plenty, of, plenty of my clients do, right? And um, and again, going back to my avatar, I know that most of my clients pay $150 for a men's haircut, right? It's crazy. And we'll pay $150 for a one-hour massage, right? I pay $60. Um, they pay $500 for an oil change. They'll have uh, pay anywhere from you know four to $600 for a lawyer per hour. So I can't come along and say, hey, I'm going to charge you $35 to do your booking, right? Yeah. So all my fees are based according to... Uh, what my clients are accustomed to be paying in their lives against all the other professionals and um, and what they value. And, you know, it's that's all it is. Like, there's uh, a lot of my clients would tell me, like, it's great because there's not a lot of places you get service nowadays. And when you deliver it and you just, take, you just pay attention, it's personalized, you take good care of them, you communicate with them, and you just give them confidence, and they will never go away. Like, it's amazing. And it's just service, right? And they come to me because of that. And sure, I mean, it's helped when I save money, Really likes to save money, but it's primarily because of the peace of mind that I deliver. Mm-hmm. So um, what are, are there any like specific tips that you learn from working in the pricing department that you apply as you're like searching for airfares um, for your clients? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of technical stuff. I mean, just how to build an itinerary, right? Like, you know, are you going to, you know, if I have a client that has to do two stops in Europe, and instead of building a three-legged flight to kayak that's priced at $6,000, then I'll perhaps know that if I build an open off, I'll get the pricing I want, and I'll just book a separate ticket the intra-Europe flight, because that's cheap and that's easily changeable, and that could save, um, that could save a lot of money. Um I can, if my clients try to let me know ahead of time what they have coming, right? So that I can pay attention to if there's sales, if there's anything coming up. Because I mean, even they're not, we're not really price sensitive, but I mean, if there's a saving ahead, we'll, we'll, we'll go for it. Um, you know, something like advanced purchase, right? If I tell a client today, this is the price and I'll go into, uh, I'll go into the booking or the, 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 the fair basis code and I'll notice that that fair expires at 14 days out and tomorrow will be 13 days out. Then I can tell them, listen, maybe we want to do this today, but tomorrow I can't guarantee you the price is most likely going to jump. So there's very little things like that. Um, pricing uh, stopovers, which is something that's in pretty much a lot of international rules that a lot of people don't know about, where you can, if you build an itinerary a certain way, you can add a stopover for, sometimes they're free, sometimes they allow you free stopovers, sometimes it's a hundred bucks extra. And that makes a huge difference because chances are if you have clients that have looked themselves, they've punched in from here to here, from here to here to here to here, and it's fine, it priced out $5,000. And when I build my ticket the way I do with, uh, with the knowledge I have of pricing, then it's going to come up at $2,500 because we got that free stopover. And it didn't calculate as an extra two flights on the whole itinerary. So there's a whole bunch of little things. And these are all things that travel agents have access to. And that it goes a little more into detail. But um, that's... That's the geeky part of me. So I love to do that. <laughs> I know. It's great hearing you talk. So because not everybody, um, may, not all advisors are as into air and, and may not even really book it for their clients. Um, when you say open job, would you mind explaining what that is? Because I'm, um, I'm sure there's some listeners that aren't up to date on Yeah, that. absolutely. 
Yeah. I have a client particularly that does the route quite often and he'll go from Vancouver to Zurich mm -hmm. and then he'll stop in Dubai and then Dubai back to Vancouver. Okay. And again, just knowledge of airline hub and where routes are going and he's an Air Canada status holder. So we usually book in Vancouver to Zurich and then Dubai back to Vancouver. And mm -hmm. that part in the middle, that we book it separately and we book a Swiss flight. And every time we do that, we can do that entire journey, and he flies premium economy most of the time, for $2,300 Canadian, mm -hmm. which, is pretty, which is pretty good. Because if we yeah. tried to do that all in the same airline, we would have to go Dubai back to Europe, back to Vancouver, which would make it that much longer for him on the plane. So not only does he save money, he saves a lot of time not spent on the plane, and just because of how I structured the itinerary with that open job, meaning he ended in a city in Zurich, and you'll be departing from another one in Dubai and all converging back to Vancouver. That's the open job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let's see. So like some of the, you also talk about with your, the service that you provide, like some of the small things you do, like you, um, what are some examples of things an advisor can do kind of value adds when someone books with them that don't cost them anything, don't take a lot of time, but can help um, justify the price increase. From most agents, I think on average, it's 25 or $30 uh, US dollars for domestic and 50 for international when we do our um, fee survey. And I'll link to the fee survey in our show notes so that people are able to get tons of information on what people are charging for. But what, what kind of value adds do you offer to your clients for the price? Uh, I add a ton of stuff, but just to give, to keep it concrete and actionable, like if an agent tomorrow wanted to do something and, and increase their fee from 25 to $50, because first of all, like a lot of, a lot of agent, I feel start, uh, charge for error for the mm -hmm. booking yep. part, right? And if you do it for the booking part, perfect, keep doing it, right? But then tomorrow morning, if you want to build a package that has, four things in it, let's say. You will do online check in 24 hours prior. You will perhaps, um, if there's upgrades available, you're gonna let them know and pay for it if they wanna upgrade your business, like cash upgrades. Uh, you're gonna prepay for their bag, right, online as you do the check-in. And then um, you're just gonna monitor their flight during that journey, right? You're gonna set some alerts, you're gonna, you're gonna keep an eye, and if there's anything that comes up, a delay, a gate change, anything, you're just gonna communicate with them and let them know. Right. Those four things, for example, if you want to sell it as an add on to your twenty five dollars, you can keep doing that. It's like, listen, hey, I have the product. You want to pay an extra, you know, if you want to make it one hundred dollars or fifty dollars, seventy five dollars, I'll do X, Y and Z. And if you still feel that this is not enough, these four items to justify the increase, then pile in a bunch of COVID stuff that you're going to have to do <laughs> extra now, because that's the easiest way to sell it. Right. And if you the long. If you, it depends on your level of confidence and the experience you have with fees. The less thing you have and the more they have, the better they go. But I understand that when you start, sometimes you feel like you need to list a lot of stuff to justify the price. Just make that list as long as you can. And these are all things that you currently do. For example, like I do, I do the online check-in. Like I track the incoming flight. If I know a client leaves at six in the morning, I'll track the flight in the night before to their airport and make sure it's on the ground because chances are tomorrow morning we're not going to have any delay. And then I'm going to send them a quick note before they go to bed. I was like, listen, your plane's on the ground. Looks all good tomorrow morning for on time. I'll make sure I know what time they're leaving the house. And if delay, then I'll let them know before they leave the house so they can leave a little later. Let's say if it's like a two, three hour delay, for example, mm -hmm. I'll let them know, right? So it's all about communicating for the most part. Um, if someone has a very tight, um, for some reason, we build a two hour over delay on the way in and all of a sudden like they're crunching to like, I don't know, 45 minutes to connect at a specific airport. Um, I will go on my phone and I will Google Toronto Pearson Airport Terminal 3 map. They'll bring me the map of the airport in Toronto with all the gates and I'll, I'll do a, uh, a screenshot and right on my phone, I will circle, here's where you're arriving, here's where you're going and I'll circle and I'll just send that up. Very simple. And then they receive it and they go, oh, and just break stress down a little bit, right? Like just some peace of mind. Somebody's there. I just got to go from here to here. If there's a train to do in between the terminals, I'll let them know there is that. So, so they know what to expect once they get off the plane. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the things I'll highlight them. And you could do that. I mean, 
clients can all do that themselves. I mean, the the American Airline app is amazing at that. And a lot of time when my clients fly uh, with AA, I have their trip on the app. I pull it up and I go, well, they need to go from this gate to this gate. They send me the routing with all the nice arrows. There's none of my finger arrows on there. <laughs> I screenshot it. I send it to my clients and they go, wow, that's amazing. It's almost like, how did you do that? And it's like, it's simple because it's a lot of time it's all stuff that your clients can do themselves as well, but they don't necessarily want to do it. And they, they probably didn't even know you could do it a lot of times, right? Not everybody's really savvy and not everybody wants to do it. Um, so that stuff, like gate changes are killer, even though, again, all, all your clients could have a gate update right on if they chose to, but a lot of them don't, right? Mm-hmm. So if there's a gate change and rushing through security, I'll send them a text like, listen, now D62. And they'll be like, shit, thank you. I didn't have to go all the way to C30 to come back home. You know, like it's just little things that you could do. And these are all the things that um, that I do when they fly. Like, I'll, what else would I do? Um, well, you have I make like a lot sometimes. of like touch points, which is, I think, unique. Like you're, you're not like during their trip there's a lot of touch points even when things aren't going wrong just to like we all know how stressful it is to travel Uh and especially if there's a tight connection like yes you can look at your phone look at the app but if you just got this text that was proactively there it's like here's Steph you need to go to this gate here's the directions instead of having to look things up so much less stressful and a time saver yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's again, it's just communicating and it's usually a lot of stuff that agents already know what to do. They already know where to look that stuff up and it's, it's nothing specific to just booking air ticket. It's just having at the back of your mind that you're, I'm trying to make it as seamless and stress-free as possible for my client on their journey. And I'm taking that on for them and they could do whatever they do. They can work, they can relax, they can get ready for their meeting. They could do whatever they want. I'll take that on. And I'll virtually fly with them is essentially what it is. Now, I mean, you could go down the rabbit hole doing a lot of stuff, right? Like I created, but you don't need, there's a lot of little touch points that don't take a lot of time easily that are easy to automate that any agent can do tomorrow that can increase the fee they charge for error with very minimal extra work on their part, but that will generate a tremendous amount of value for your client. And if you manage to capitalize on that value with pricing, um, all you're going to get is rating fans at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, you also have um, kind of a program you're working on and just launching that your goal is to kind of teach advisors how to double their air revenue. Um, do you, can you chat a little bit more on that and where people can go to learn more information? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just I want to work with like established travel advisors to help them double their air revenue. And essentially, it's leveraging work they already do, um, and it doesn't sacrifice any of their particular niche market or the specialty they do, and it won't jeopardize your client base, which is what a lot of advisors are worried about when they start into fees. Um, and it's just going to take, you know, essentially, I want to I want to show on that little piece of the airfare how we can monetize it, and the hope is that as a byproduct of agents will draw parallels in their niche market. Says, listen, when I do the air, I could do this type of service. I'll get this much money. Wait, I do cruises. I can also do similar kind of packaging, similar kind of thing. And then slowly you move your fees across your business from the little air. Eventually you get to your niche market. And then ultimately you get to a point where you charge air all the way across your business for everything you do for everyone you serve. Uh, but that's just a way to... Start small, and I'll show you how we can make air money with air, which nobody thinks you can, but it's it's feasible, and it's really about service, and it can transfer across um, across everything an agent do, and we'll go from you know like anything, and the, the curriculum is not all set yet. It's going to be launching in about a month from now, uh, but we're going to go with you know like looking at some mindset stuff and how you become authority and how. You have, you know, we'll look at your clients, your current client base that you have, uh, what your future clients are going to look like when you design a service experience. Um, we're going to work on the delivery package. We're going to sit and I'm going to show you all the tools, all the automation that you can use to effectively produce all that, which is going to ultimately generate more revenue on air that you already do anyway, and hopefully increase your profitability. If anything, just at one income, not one revenue stream. 
and you know and from there i'm hoping it's going to grow into your business sideways and then you're going to eventually as, a, as an advisor become uh Tremendously profitable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Start with air and then take the rest. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the, the details for signing up, because depending when you're listening to this, uh, the the product may or may not be launched, but you can go to airfareconsultant.com slash H-A-R. Um, and I, uh, there'll be either, there'll be a landing page where you can sign up for more details and, and get on the list so Larry can keep you updated. Um, but let's let's kind of talk about your actual fees that you're charging. So right now you have two tracks for your fees. One is like the more transactional. Each ticket is this much. Um, and then you have your monthly retainer program. And you uh, are very clear about your fees. Like they're listed on your website, which I'll link to in the show notes. I'll link to the um, fee page so people can see the pricing structure. But let's start with the um, transactional fees. So how did you come up with pricing for that? Oh, I started way back when I started, when I left Fly Center and I started charging fees. And um, I didn't know how, again, at the time I thought it needs to be based on the time it's going to take me to do a particular booking. And I didn't know because I was just starting out. So I was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to put a percentage, right? People are accustomed to percentages. People go to round, usually they tip 15%. So I start with 10%. And then I start building like that 10%. And at the time when I first started, I was doing everything for everyone from cruises to safaris to air to all inclusive vacations. I did everything just like a good travel agent would start out to be. And, um, and then at some point when I had a good understanding of how long it would take me to do each thing, because I realized that 10% of a $300 ticket and 10% of a $1,500 ticket, they both take the same amount of time. I just make that much less money on the $300 one, right? Mm-hmm. So then I, I had a, a flat rate. So then I became, um, then I built some flat rates again by domestic international and by cabin class. And then, um, and then after a, another year and a bit of doing that, I realized that most of my good clients that I really enjoy working with would only use me for air anyway. And that's what I'm world class at. That's what I love to do. So I decided I was just going to focus on air and drop everything else. Because all my good clients clearly didn't need me for hotels or cars or anything. Because their their assistant, their executive assistant, their wife, they would do it themselves. But they would take care of that stuff, and they only uh, got me on air. So I start with that, and then from there I progressively increase um, my fees um, to the point where even that one time I think I shared that story where I was increasing my fees, and I was very nervous, yeah. and I put that email out, and there was about sixty sixty or eighty people on my list at the time, and. And I, it was all about the fees are going on, blah, 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 this is blah, blah, blah. And then I send the email, but I forgot to attach the attachments that had the new fee structure. And in the end, only two people email me back and says, uh, what are the fees now? Right? <laughs> so it just kind of reinforces that the fees a lot of the time is like a, is an advisor's hurdle as opposed to on the client side. And that was my first realization and it progressed over the time. Uh, but that's when it first started. Mm-hmm. And then after a while, because I was only servicing, I mean, I would say that I probably service today, like I don't service more than 25, 20 to 30 clients, pretty much, right? So even though I do 700 and some thousand, like it's not like zillion amount of flights, like I don't do a ton of stuff, right? Um, my goal has always been to charge the most amount of money and serve the least amount of clients. And uh, and again, after a while, it was like now I started to do uh, frequent flyer management for my clients and do the upgrades and all that kind of stuff just to, again, raise my fees and increase my value. And in and, and terms of the frequent flyer program, you know, not many people are very savvy with it. I'm not super savvy, but I definitely know a lot more of my clients to make sure that we can use all the benefits. And, and frequent flyers with status, it's on a yearly basis type thing. So I wanted a bigger commitment from my clients so I started this retainer program which would be based on a year's worth of travel from a client mm-hmm. and we would divide it up equally in in 12 month payments so a month they pay me a flat rate and uh, based on the amount of flying they do and when we first start the relationship we agree on a price and then six months later we review it and if they fly way more than they told me then we'll increase it and if they fly less then we'll adjust it just anything to create a win-win situation for both of us and um, and it's amazing for me because now I kind of stabilized my revenue a little bit. It makes that every time I start a new month, then I have the, the revenue that's not guaranteed because I still don't lock my clients into contracts. I still do month to month. 
I want to keep the onus and uh, like the make sure that I own up to my end of the bargain and I keep at it as opposed to lock them in for a year. Because when you say retainer, a lot of time, most of my clients go like, ah, yeah, I did hire a lawyer on retainer. And as soon as I sign, I never heard from them again. Mm -hmm. So I needed to be specific, but anyway, so I do the retainer thing and uh, my clients understand that there are months that we're going to travel more than the retainer fee, months that we're going to travel way less. But at the end of the year, we're both going to come out ahead. I'll be happy financially. They'll be happy with the service and what they receive. And we're both winning and going forward. So I guess two questions on the retainer. It, are the kind of the tiers set for your, like, if you like have $50,000 worth of air during the year, it's this much. And then secondly, like, how did COVID affect these retainer clients? Are, are they still with you? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. The um, So the retainer, it first started, I had one flat fee for everyone, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I oh, shot myself in the foot on that one with a few clients. Um, <laughs> and now it's been for the last two years, it's been, uh, it's been based on their status, right? So their airline status dictates how much they fly. That doesn't account for flying another airline that doesn't count, but it is a pretty good idea. Like I know what a hundred thousand miles like status, one K status flies. And they have a price. So I tried to fit people within like the 25 to 35, 50 to 75 K and a hundred and super elite plus they have a separate fee. And, uh, and that's worked for a while. And then I'm going to attempt to change it a little bit again. I'm going to try something different where I'm going to change the structure to not so much to how much they fly, but how much they want to pay for the service, the service they want. Kind of a bit of a, a SaaS model, like the service as a software industry, mm -hmm. uh, where you pay less, you get less, you pay more, you get a little more, and then there'll be like a little more access. And then the last year is going to have full out management, uh, frequent flyer management program, upgrades, miles, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then kind of give some perspective. It, same way as when I present airfares, I try to present the perspective for the event so that it makes it very obvious where they should go, right? Yeah. Which one they should pick which package they should go into. So that's going to be my, my foray into uh, buying this particular pricing model. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so did, so did any clients end up um, kind of with cost saving measures uh, dropping the retainer with COVID? Oh yeah, that's right. The second question. So, um, so what happened after I, I uh, like most of us stopped canceling stuff like at the end of <laughs> March, uh, but the first of April came along because all my retainer goes on the first of the month. Um, then I realized I was going to be really affected by that. For some reason before that, I didn't even think everybody else was panicking. I was like, I'm still good. I'm still working. I'm canceling. I'm still working, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then I went to bed one night and I was like, ah, no, I have really good clients. I'm pretty sure they're going to hang. And then I got up the next day and I didn't feel that confident. I was like, hmm, maybe just ask them. So at the time I had six on the retainer and I sent them seven, six. I, had, I sent them each an individual video message which says something along the line of, listen, the next payment is coming up. I understand the situation we're in. And to preface this, didn't want them to go first before I reach out to them, down their list of expenses and go travel. Yeah, get that out of there. We're not going to need that for a while. So I just wanted to make sure I was ahead of that curve. And I asked them, I said, listen, if you see any issues with the payment of the, the month, let me know. I'm here to help. Whatever I can do to help you go through this, we'll go through this together. And I send that out. And then the answers I got back were just amazing. Like I got, uh, first of all, I have one client, my newest client, which we'd only been in business together for about two months. So we didn't really have a lot of time to build that type of relationship. So I was, okay, that, that's fair, fair game. Um, and then I, the other ones went from uh, Larry, your good friend. Uh, I'm not affected at all because he's in the service of the software uh, industry. Um, I'm more than happy to support you through this. He's sending you invoice. Another client said, um, um, he's an Instagram guy, so he's like, listen, Larry, I understand how the retainers work. A lot of work. We did a lot of flying in the first three months of the year up until mid-March. Uh, and then at the time, we thought it was only going to last a month or two, right? So he's like, we're going to do plenty of travel in the back end of the year. I'm more than happy to support you. I'm not affected by this. Please keep sending me your stuff. And then the last, one, the last one was like, he's like, he said, um, and he was a relatively new client as well, but uh, very relationship-based in everything he does, which is amazing. And that's how we got connected. Um, and he was like, listen, if you were to go under and not go through this, I don't know where I would go for my air service. Like, I, I don't know. I don't want to find out. I don't want to spend the time essentially saying I have a vested interest in your survival. So please keep sending me your invoice and I'll pay it. And, um, and I had a fire one client. 
halfway through the summer, which was, he, he wasn't paying me. I was kind of giving him a break, but it didn't work anymore. So, uh, so I left that goal to, to fill that spot with somebody else. Uh, but essentially, yeah, most of these clients are still paying me to this day. And most of them haven't flown since uh, yeah, the middle of March. Ah, oh, it's so dreamy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do run into someone that like a new client that comes in and the retainer program would be good for them and make financial sense, um, but you're you're getting pushback from them that they aren't so keen on the value of it. Um, what would you like? How do you approach that? Um, it depends. I think before we talk value, I think we would have a conversation first. Like I always like to talk to the clients and see if there is a fit, mm -hmm. first of all, in between the two of us. And I would, uh, and before I bring in pricing, I would, I would try to figure out where they need my help. Like, why did they call me? Like, what was so, uh, when somebody mentioned my name, somebody mentioned what I did, what in there was like, ah, I need that. Like what pain point, like, what are you most frustrated by? And, and, and if I feel like I can def I can definitely help there and remove that pain, then we talk about pricing and it's never really an issue. A lot of time, if somebody has a pushback, for example, I'll say, listen, let's just do a trial run. Just give me a chance. I'll do the first booking, whatever the fee is. And uh, when you come back, I'm going to call you and I'm going to ask you, so did you feel like you got enough value for the amount you paid? And if you say, I don't feel like I did, then I would just refund him the money, no questions asked, and we'll go in our separate ways. Um, that's one of the thing. Other than that, we would do as well, like a lot of the clients, well, not a lot, but one client in particular was like, listen, um, you know, agree on a fee. And then, you know, like we're two, we're two, uh, individuals that get along and, uh, we'll make it work. And we both have the confidence that we would come to a win-win solution in the end. And we settled on a price and then we did six months and happens that it stayed the same price for the last year. Um, so there's multiple ways of doing it, but sometimes uh, you kind of know, right. When somebody's really that price sensitive that you just don't want to work with them. So yeah. I don't have any issue saying no either. Listen, I'm not a good fit. I'm not the person for you. I can't really help you that way. Um, cause that way it just leaves that slot open for somebody who really fits the bill to come in and, uh, and for us to have a good chance of having a good working relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, you had mentioned earlier that part of the package is that you're servicing their frequent flyer program. So for people that are interested in, in what's involved with that for you, what does it look like? What are you doing to manage the program? Which I, by the way, um, am horrible. I, I need someone to manage my frequent flyer programs. Cause I'm sure I'm throwing things out the window left and right. Actually, I know I am. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, essentially what it comes down to is right from uh, when we do the research, right? As part of my process and as part of my recommendation to the client, I will always have in the back of my mind, okay, we need to worry about the frequent fly program. We need to know, and we'll have a strategy for the end of the year. Like, what do we want to do? Do we stay super elite? Do we want to keep 100,000 miles? Do we want, are we okay to drop? What are the benefits we're going to lose? Are we okay with them? We analyze all that and we set a plan. And my job is to make sure that I keep it on track. And always remind him that, listen, we can go to Canada because that's where the status is. It's going to cost an extra $500. Or we can go this cheaper route with another airline, with British Airways, for example. But you're, not, you're going to miss out on all these miles. And perhaps at the end of the year, we're going to fall short, right? So that goes, that's the first step of it. Um, second, it will be, you know, sometimes, and even in the list, the Freedom Flight Program is just making sure your miles get allocated to your account, which mm -hmm. is something silly to do. But most people don't do it, right? Most people don't know if one ticket doesn't, right? <laughs> so I ask that, and, and every every quarter I do it or I get somebody else to do it, and we just go check, 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 take 15 minutes, right? But that's part of the overall value that the client really enjoys. Um, I'll do, uh, if they have status, I'll make sure that they uh, they know or we know all the benefits that come with the status so we can leverage every single one of them whenever we can. Um, I'll handle a lot of the upgrade, right? If we can uh, use some of the upgrades that they're entitled to when they, uh, when they travel as a status holder, then I'll make sure we book in a specific fair class in order to leverage that. So there's a bit of a technicality on that particular front, but, but I would say like the, the generally speaking, it's just always reminding them because everybody wants to save money. It doesn't matter how much money you make. If you see a lower price, you'd be like, yeah, let's go with that. And you're like, yeah, but you're going to miss out on this, 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 and this. And they go, Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Let's go here. Let's do here. So sometimes it's just reminding them constantly. 
Um, and then that's the biggest part is just figure making sure they stay on track to do it, to, to keep the status. Because once they have it, nobody ever wants to go back and lose benefits of traveling, yeah. especially when you've, when you've gotten them. So, um, so that's a, a part of the freaking management program. Cool. Well, I, I think one thing that can really scare advisors away from air only bookings is debit memos. And if you aren't familiar with debit memos, I'll link in the show notes to an article that goes over all things debit memos. It's very exciting. Uh, but for you, Larry, have you found that debit memos are a serious issue that's like cutting into your profits, that it's this huge risk that you have to worry about? No, not for me specifically. I mean, I, I view it as a cost of doing business, to be honest. I mean, it's no different than credit card fees. You know, like I, most of my clients use American Express and that's the highest percentage that that's out there. And it's just the way it is, right? Like I just eat it up and it's just part of how I price my, my stuff and it's all, it's all included. Um, for myself, for example, like I, I don't, I average about, I don't know, six, seven hundred dollars um a year in debit memos which is not huge mm -mm. but you can definitely get one i had over two thousand dollars once and it was an error and it got all fixed and whatnot but it definitely got my blood boiling so i can only imagine if you've got several of them and it gets to add up and you're like and sometimes it's a little it's very attention to detail and a lot of time it just needs a good checklist to make sure that when you do your when you issue your ticket if you do that you follow everything that's on there and a lot of host agency has like um a ticket queue that somebody else will go through to make sure you don't miss anything so that's a good way to do it or i mean to to, to anything that i do I, w I don't have to do the booking right i can use a wholesaler um i any of them i can hand i can give them the ticketing and i could get them to take the debit memos if they make a mistake they'll pay for it the only thing is when i don't do the booking personally it gives it takes the control out of my hands a little bit in terms of how active i can be when the client's at the airport and the flight can cancel and delay and whatnot so um i prefer to keep it and the risk of having a bigger debit memo is worth it has a bigger upside for me uh in terms of uh, how fast i can help the client how seamless i can make it and how i can jump the queue and grab a seat before anybody else does as opposed to call the wholesaler wait on hold potentially and um having said that i work with a wholesaler and they're available like this to email phone they're only close from midnight to five in the morning um so i would i wouldn't hesitate to have them ticket my stuff but if you're if somebody's afraid of debit memos there's other ways to do it than just issue to issue the tickets yourself you can still do all the F, the extra services the concierge the, the highly personalized stuff you could still do that on top of any tickets that's been issued by a wholesaler no problem at all Mm -hmm. And and for those that aren't familiar, when we're talking about debit memos, we're talking about typically when you're in the GDS system is when you're going to be getting the debit memos. And if you're not in the GDS system, your host agency might have a ticketing desk or your consortium might have a ticketing desk um, that can help you um, with that. But they'll they'll often like the host agencies, most of them will have some kind of a um, not exactly sure the term. I think it's like a mid office system that's watching for fraud or different things in ticketing that are missing that could cause debit memos which is kind of a mm -hmm. fail safe for you yeah. um well let's see i think we've got a good feel for your fee structure and kind of the thought process that drives your agency that it's really about the service and not really the transaction of booking the air so let's um move into the next section where we can kind of talk about your booking process and what you do <laughs> So I, I think my first question is your, your, your business, you said, is built on the idea that you have fewer clients and your, the, the idea that you're able to give them more time and attention. Um, and I know you said this earlier, but could you repeat this? How many clients um, do you have at any given time? I probably don't have live, like 30, mm -hmm. no more than that. I mean, I, all, all said and done over the years, I have a list longer than that. But a people that constantly keeps coming back, that makes like, I would say like 85% of my, of my book of business, but it's no more than 20 to 30 clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with this smaller set of clients that you're working with, um, and it sounds like it's on a pretty regular, semi regular basis, um, that allows you mm -hmm. to kind of get in a, it's a little bit different from like, say a leisure agent where maybe they're only booking a couple tri trips a year for their, um, clients, but that a lot of, Booking a lot for them gives you the chance to kind of get in a rhythm with them. And when we last chatted, you had mentioned that you train your clients on how to communicate their flight needs to you. So tell 
tell us more about what that looks like and why it's helpful. Yeah, I mean, the uh, that took a while to come, but now it's it's working really good. I just need to remind myself to do it as opposed to do it the way they've always done it. And um, and it, it's, um, it started because one particular client I was working with, and I, I work with mostly entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs, when they wear the hat of the, the business owner, they make decisions based on numbers, and they're very pragmatic that way. And then when they travel, then it's a different person. Like they have a different hat, like they're relaxed and like it's different, right? So I wanted them to communicate the information over to me in the travel mode. So what I tell most of my clients is like, when you relay the information, let's make it look like I'm the pilot, I'm flying your private jet, and you tell me exactly, ideally, if there was zero constraints, right? There's no time constraints, there's no flight departures, there's no cost constraints, nothing. Tell me how the trip would go. Okay, what time would you leave preferably? Uh, what time would you arrive at destination? Why? Because I like to go to bed early or because I have an early speaking engagement the next day. Just give me the context, right? Give me what you would like it to look like. Ideally, I would come back, you know, I'll stop speaking at 3 o'clock. By the time I get to the airport, 6 o'clock. And I could see myself at home by 9.30 by the time the kids go to bed. Maybe it's a little too late. But anyway, you, you, get, you get the gist of it. So then when I get that information, then I'll go in and I'll, be, I'll build what I call the baseline. And mm-hmm. I'll price that out. And I'll come out to, let's say, $1,500. And that's After like that, meeting every single one of their needs. like Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly the itinerary, exactly the way they want it, as opposed to to start with the cheapest and work their way up. I start with what they really want, and that brings the baseline at $1,500. And then I'll go and I'll look above that line. What's the better product? What's the better airline what's the better uh, airplane you can fly on what's a better business class if they're flying business right could we upgrade you to a better airline a better type of aircraft that has a much better life flat seat um and then i'll price that out and all this if it's an extra four hundred dollars or five hundred dollars to make a round number at two thousand um i'll list all benefits that you're going to get for that five hundred dollars and then they can decide based on if they want it and then i'll go lower and i'll be like listen if you really wanted to go this low we could go to this rock bottom and then, but this is what you'd be missing out on. You wouldn't have that. You'd have half your miles. We'd have to pay for seed. You wouldn't get your bags. You wouldn't get priority. You wouldn't get all this stuff. So then the client can decide uh, easily. It's almost a no-brainer when you put it that way. They'll be like, for sure, let's go with the baseline or whatever it is. Because they've seen on either side and they can make a really quick decision. And eventually it goes down to a point where I just send them one itinerary and it's their baseline. And they just go, let's just go with that. That we don't have it's less work for everybody. It's a less lot work for them to think about it, to look through a bunch of different options, and it works for them. They're okay with the price because a lot of time it's not really about the price, but they they just say let's go with that. So with clients that have been working for a while, that's pretty much the, the process that we have now. It's very fast, very quick for them to download the information to me, and it's very easy for me to return back what they should do, and it takes a lot less time for both of us, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. And you use yeah. an app that I'd never heard of before, um, which is kind of unique to communicate as your main source. You send the itineraries via email so that everything's in writing. But when you're kind of going back and forth with the client, um, I, I think it's called Boxer. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's okay. kind of a, walkie, a walkie-talkie app. Um, and it's great because, you know, like, and sometimes we'll have almost a phone conversation to the walkie-talkie. Well, they'll be talking and I'll be listening. Mm-hmm. So you can do that. You don't have to wait till it's done to listen. And oftentimes they go do something else and they come back and they just commu- we communicate when it works for each of us, right? But it's voice. We can. It's so much faster, you know. Part like the, next to a phone call. Uh, that's definitely the second biggest thing. So yeah, we do use a lot of voice stuff. Um, I have a segment of my clients that are, you know, I would say like 55 and above, and that's all they know. It's talk phone. They build relationships based on flying across the pond and shaking hands over a scotch after a dinner, coming back done deal right and then they always call so for them the the, the box in the walkie talkie is really great because now they can with the time zones and everything they could get it off their chest whenever they want to and i get it when i when i get up and, and we just communicate it that way and it makes it very efficient as opposed to wait for emails and inboxes and all that kind of stuff so that's a pretty cool app yeah I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes if anyone's interested in kind of integrating it into their agency so um you talked a little bit about consolidators um, or wholesalers earlier. So where do you typically end up booking your clients there? Is it mostly done in the GDS or 
like what percentage is GDS versus consolidators? Do you ever book like direct on the sites? Um, it's pretty much 90% in a GDS, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's probably even 95% of GDS, like a handful with the wholesaler. Um, and then uh, I do happen sometimes, you know, sometimes you get a client that gets a percentage discount because their TV screen wasn't working and you can only redeem those online. So, and because to me, the, the, the business is based on, I get compensated for the work I do by the client. And if I happen to work on it, to have to book on a website, because somebody wants a Southwest flight, for example, I don't get commission anyway as Canadian. I don't know if anybody else does, but I think it's straight across the board and nobody does. But I'm still getting paid for it, right? So I don't. It doesn't matter to me. I don't need to be booking during through a particular channel. Um. So yeah, at, at time I book. I'm not. I'm not just. I need to be in the GDS all the time because I've only been in GDS for seven years. So it's you know like I'm efficient at it, but I'm nowhere near what a lot of people do. But I use it, you know, whenever I need to because I like to keep the control over the PNR so that I can uh, more efficiently service the client when it's uh, when it's needed really fast. Yeah. And and one thing I learned from you when we were chatting was kind of the how frequent flyers pay play, I should say, like within consolidators. And if you're managing the program, one thing that you have to be aware of um, if you're going to book into a consolidator. Can you chat a little more on that? Yeah, absolutely. What I found is that a lot of times, I mean, if anybody's familiar with frequent flyer programs and most airlines are about the same nowadays in North America which you need to fly a certain amount of miles and you need to spend a certain amount of money in order to get the status, right? It's been miles forever. And for the last two, three years now, there's that extra level of, 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 um, of, of criteria where you need to meet a certain dollar amount. And if you book um, a business class ticket a lot of time on consolidated, on, I don't even know how to say it now, on, uh, on the wholesalers, yeah. consolidators, um, usually they can have pretty significant discount. Like you can say like two, three, you can send thousands of dollars going through them. But what happened is a lot of those will be bulk fares, right? And they're labeled such, but bulk fares usually means that it doesn't come with a dollar amount attached to it. So even though you book on Air Canada, Air Canada doesn't have a way to see how much you actually pay for the tickets. Therefore, they don't allocate any dollars to the status, which mm -hmm. to me, it's like, I, I bring it up to the clients. Like, listen, we can, sometimes we can afford to not get the dollars, right, for the status, and we'd rather take the savings. But you need to know that that's a possible hurdle, right? Um, but that's one of the biggest ones, and so I have to make sure, and there's some net fares that do it as well. Net fares, most fares will give you the miles. That's not an issue. They always credit the miles to the account, regardless of what type of fares you're in. But some of them won't give the dollar amount that's crucial to qualifying for status. And something I learned the hard way, and now I know. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, that's really great stuff, and I, I think we've, um, I've just got a few more questions I want to ask you that don't really fall under a nice umbrella topic, so um, mm -hmm. we'll move into my catch-all, all, all other stuff section. <laughs> so, let's see, um, what kind of marketing, because when we were, when we were scheduling our call, it was really funny, because I was like, okay, let me know which number, like, to reach you at, and then, Larry writes back, I'm looking forward to see you. And then like, I'm looking in his signature when I'm getting ready to call him and I'm like, oh, there's no phone number there. And I go to his website and there's no phone number on there. And I was like, Facebook stalking. And I was like, oh, cool. There's a phone number I can call him at. Um, but what kind of like, clearly you don't do tons and tons of marketing because the phone number was hard to find, but um, zero. <laughs> what kind of, zero. Okay, so no social media, no networking groups, nothing. Not a, not for clients. I mean, in a sense, you do when you network, right? And mm -hmm. because you build relationship, eventually you get to, hey, what do you do, right? And once you build that relationship, then I, I guess it's a kind of marketing, same as referrals, which is word of mouth. But that's pretty much all I all all I all I go on. Like that's how my business started, and that's how it's grown. And sure, it's a little slower at times, right? Because you need to spend time to build trust with this client before they feel comfortable putting uh, another relationship that they have with somebody else in your hands, right? To, to get that trust directly. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really touchy, but it's, it always makes really good referrals and really amazing clients. And then once you've got some good clients and you can, you, you know, and you, and the good thing about referrals is that a lot of time I'm very transparent about fees. 
because I feel like everybody's used a travel agent before and nobody's ever paid anything. So I just want to make sure I'm just like, listen, uh, there's a fee to use with my service. And I always bring it up. And most of the time I get, uh, oh, that's, that's fine. Uh, if Johnny pays it, like he referred me to you, I'm sure if he pays it, it's fair and I'll pay it as well. And uh, so that's another reminder that the hurdle with the fees is often on the side of the advisor so much on the side of the client. Um, but yeah, so I do, I don't really do a lot of stuff. Like I, I tried over the COVID, I did a few videos to help out people and give them information about new rules and regulations and credits and what they can do and all that kind of stuff. That's pretty much the extent of it. Like I don't do anything specifically targeted to getting new clients in terms of Facebook ads or Instagram ads. I mean, I have accounts, but I don't really use them for that. But often here and there, I'll say something and somebody will go, Oh, you do that. And then maybe that gets me a lead, I guess, but I don't, it's not deliberate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what, what I love talking about or why I love talking to so many different advisors is because there's a zillion, like, Sometimes people that are newer to the industry um, want there to be like one way to do things. But what I love about it is it's just so diverse, the way that people market themselves and the structures of their companies. And that's kind of the purpose of the podcast is to shine light on all these different possibilities. And you can take and pick what you like from each one and you can create an agency that works for you. You know, I'll say, I'll, I'll tell you a story though. And I guess in a sense that is marketing. But I, now that I think about it, it is. But um, I had a um, a client I'd worked with in the past that was hosting an event in Cabo San Lucas. And it's a very uh, select event. There's only 150 entrepreneurs that go to it. And um, he reached out to me because he's like, Larry, I can't find any direct flights in Canada. And then I looked into it and I was like, well, because you picked the slowest period of the season because he's renting the whole hotel and obviously – when nobody's there, yeah, sure, have the whole hotel. But comes with it comes off season, and in off season in Canada, there's very little nonstop service from Canada to Mexico. In the winter, there's tons of them. But in in the month of October, the, the season starts in November usually. And he was like, "Oh my God!" He's like, "It's going to be that complicated for all my clients to get there." And I was like, "Kind of." And they're only a few days, right? So it's a it's a very quick turnaround. Oh yeah. So, uh, so he reached back out to me and he's like, listen, how much would you charge me if, um, if I was to bring your name up and I'd ask people to contact you? Like I would offer that on me as part of a service of what I do, like a concierge service. And I would offer your service for all my clients that come. And at the time I was like, uh, I feel like I should be paying you to access 150 of my ideal clients. And I said, listen, um, let's do it. I'll do it for free. I feel that's going to be enough exposure for me. And at the end of the day, if I get two or three more clients out of this bunch, that's going to make it. So I guess in a sense, that's a bit of marketing, if you will. But again, it's always in the, it, it, from my, my, my perspective, it's always just help as much as you can and good things will come back. I just never know. And I still have clients that's been in now that say, Hey, remember me? You booked me to Cabo, right? And I'm like, Oh yeah. You know? <laughs> And because I did a good impression and they didn't pay anything, and but I, I got to, you know, show what I do, how I can do it. And I'll, I'll give you just one last one. I had uh, one CEO of a, um, a staffing company, a virtual assistant staffing company. And if you know anything about outsourcing and whatnot, travel is some often something gets outsourced, air travel, like air booking, hotels, that kind of stuff, right? So she thought she was, she, she'd done a lot. And like a lot of clients I come across, they go, Oh yeah, I could do that. Like I do bookings all the time. Like I book air all the time. Like I'm really good at it actually. Like I'm fantastic at it. And people tell me that until I handled their travel, you go, Oh, okay. That's pretty good. Like I never thought about half this stuff. Right. And even then she's like, and then after a while she's like, ah, that is what you do. Right. Cause sometimes when you explain people what you do in their head, I mean, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. No brainer, whatever. And then she was so amazed after the trip and she was like, now I understand what you do. So sometimes offering a trial to someone is probably the best way to get them to buy in or get them to, for them to, to see what you're capable of doing. And a lot of time, something really cool that somebody could do next time they book air is like, just communicate your thought process. When you, you send an itinerary to someone, uh, tell them things that you looked at that probably they didn't, or they never looked at, or they never, never think about looking at. So an example, I would send an itinerary to a client and I would say, listen, um, I would recommend you take this particular itinerary because it has an hour and 45 minute connection. 
there's one faster at 45 minutes, but you know, you're going to go through Minneapolis and we know what can happen in the winter. A little bit of de-icing here goes 25 minutes and then boom, 45 minutes connection is gone. Right? So I build a buffer so that we have enough time knowing it's winter, knowing where you're connecting to get you to your final destination. And people go like, I would never thought about looking at the airport I'm connecting to. And mm-hmm. same thing goes with connecting in Denver, Chicago, Toronto, New York in the wintertime. If I can use Seattle, San Francisco, Phoenix, Houston, right? I will. And I will bring that up to my clients. Um, other times it'll be like uh, something as simple as, um, you know, I think if you're going to fly 16 hours across the Pacific to go to Australia, I would recommend this one because this one is on a Dreamliner. It's on a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Nobody else knows except for me. Well, not, but my clients mostly don't know. This is the brand new aircraft. It's made of this composite. And the advantage of flying on this aircraft is that it's got very high humidity content in the cabin. Uh, um, it's pressurized at an altitude that's lower than any other airliner by 2,000 feet, which helps with dizziness and dryness and, and jet lag and all that kind of stuff. So all these advantages, if you're going to compound that for 16 hours, I would definitely fly on that bird. And people are like, oh, oh, I would have taken this other plane because it's cheaper and it goes through China. So a lot of time, like what I go in my head when I do the research, I felt like there's a lot of value if I can just communicate that to the, to the client. It increased mm-hmm. my credibility because now they're like, shit, this guy knows what he's doing. Right? He's looking at stuff that I never thought I should be looking at. Right? So it makes it that much easier to sell something to someone and to ask for money for it because they know that you're doing more than they could at that time. Even though everybody knows that booking a flight is fairly easy. Well, it is. You click, 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 but oftentimes you don't, you don't see what's in the, the cracks, right? The layovers and the airlines and like the tight oh, yeah. connections and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so I had to explain a lot of that. And it, uh, again, along with the same thing as before, which was started as tracking flights from my clients for my own sanity, turns out to be a really cool customer service tool because now I can let them know it's delay and they go, shit, that's good. Thank you. And just, you know, so it's all these little things that you can do and, um, and it's, you know, everybody can do it. So easy. Yeah. So, well, well, when you're talking about, um, like the dreamliner and the humidity in the cabin, like these types of the, these bits of knowledge that you're coming up with, um, for someone that's not as familiar with airlines, um, or airfares, um, where are some places you would recommend, people go to learn more so that they can come up with these like is there a a facebook group or a airline enthusiast magazine that they can subscribe to where do you get these details the easiest thing you could do is i use seatguru.com uh-huh and it's as as you put the flight number ac123 the date and it already knows what type of aircraft is flying on there and then you can look at the type of aircraft and on there, it's going to detail, does it have USB power plug in? Does it have, you know, like what's the business class look like? What's the service on board look like? And sometimes it's just be like, Hey, make sure you bring an adapter because they, or make sure you make sure you bring a USB cable because they don't have 110 volts on there. If you want to charge your, your phone on a hundred, you know, if you go on a long. Um, so these are just the little things you could do. Legroom is a big one. Right, like everybody's flown before. Everybody knows that sometimes you're in a really tight plane, and again, on flight where you could see what's the pitch uh, in economy, what's the the distance in between the seat in front of you, and if a different routing has more legroom, and you know your plan is six three, then perhaps you bring that up, right? And they don't have to find out on the plane before a, I wouldn't say a sixteen hour flight for that short, but for a lengthy flight. So, um, so those are two really quick things that someone can do. Um, apart from that, um, yeah, anything that you go through, through your head when you look at it, just don't assume that the clients, oh, and the clients do the same research and look at the same thing, point them out, list them out. And if it's too long on an email, I, I usually send a voice memo attached to the email, listing all that stuff like quickly, like a quick two minute jolt to Mm -hmm. give them why I recommended this and why they should go with it. And as the relation develops and the trust builds, eventually it's just, it's, it's, it's a lot faster for the, for the advisor to do all the work because you already have the trust and you don't get the, Oh, but I saw this particular flight yesterday on Google flight. What about that one? What do you like people eventually stop looking 
right? Like if you have some of those clients, eventually as you showcase what you do, what you look at and how thorough you are with your research, uh, people will just completely trust you and then they will never look again. And you can, you know, you can take full control uh, of their air. So. Yeah. Well, the, so the other thing I want to mention before we start to wrap things up is if an advisor really likes the structure of your company and um, so you had talked earlier about it's, it's your hope that they can apply kind of the theory be, of the fee practicing to whatever their niche is um, and whatever, wherever their p passions lie. Um, any, so any agency can switch gears and start providing um, that white glove service to their clients if that's appealing to them. But I, I noticed there was like probably one caveat to that, that people should be aware of. And because when I asked you about your work-life balance, Larry, um, <laughs> when dealing yeah. with such high-touch clientele, you, you mentioned, you were like, mm, not work-life balance. It's more of an integration. So um, yeah. <laughs> any words of wisdom for someone whose work is more integrated into their lives or that is thinking about um, becoming an agency that gives a lot more personal attention? Like, uh, how can you bring the work-life balance back into there? Yeah, see, for me, if I had to redo it again, I would really pay attention on uh, what I put into. So uh, this is how much it's going to cost and this is what I'm going to do. Everything that has to do with my time and my own time and working 24-7 and working on the weekends and working on holidays and working all that stuff, I would try to limit it to, to the minimum. That's what I would try to do differently because I'll tell you, uh, you know, since COVID started, like I don't sleep with my phone anymore and I always have. Uh, again, just proactively trying to make sure the flights depart on time, the flight connects at the other end. And if it's in Europe, it's in the middle of the night. Um, I don't want to go back there. And that's part of the adjustments that I'm making with my new packages and whatnot. Cause yeah, you can list a bunch of stuff, but just read them and just look at them and see if it's going to lead you down that rabbit hole that I happen to fall into, which is it's one thing to deliver highly personalized service and whatnot. Sometimes you can go to the point where, yeah, it's going to push you to working way too much. And if you have families and if you have a significant other, then it could definitely encroach on that particular time. And it's good to train your clients as well that um, I've done that with some of my clients. For most of them, I was like, you have access to my cell phone directly, right? But I'll put the onus on you to determine if it is an emergency or if it is not, okay? So if you send me something on Saturday, I'll trust that you're going to tell me, listen, I'm sending it to you now perfectly okay if you respond on Monday. Or listen, it's Saturday, I need to fly tomorrow morning. That's an urgency, I'll do it, right? I don't want to create this, you know, you can call me at any time for anything, right? So I've been putting that out there and I'm fortunate enough that most of my clients do the same thing. Like they have the same ones and they're also available, but they like to be off sometimes, right? They don't yeah. always have their phone on. Um, so yeah, so the there's multiple ways, for example, um, I, when I set an alert for my client, it comes directly to me. So I'm responsible for it to look at it and to act on it. And it can come at any time, right? Usually they send me an alert, uh, three hours before the flight, so let me know it's on time. Anytime in between that and the flight departure, if there's any delays, they'll let me know. It's going to let me know when the flight is airborne and it's going to let me know when the flight shuts down. Um, but if I didn't want to take on all that work that potentially can turn into a seven day, 24 hour whirlwind. I can just sign my clients up for it and they can get the email, right? And they'll get the updates and whatnot while they travel, right? So there's, there's this, I mean, are you going to be able to charge as much as if I did what I did? Maybe not, right? But it all depends on the level of commitment you're willing to do. But at the end of the day, if you're not going to go all out and specialize in airfare, the point is not to go that deep down the rabbit hole. But there's definitely a lot of just essential service stuff that you could do for your clients that are very easy to do and take very little time and provide a great value for your client. And you can easily just double your income that way. I mean, easily go from 25 to 50 or 25 to 100. I mean, I charge $175 for an economy international ticket, right? And I never get any pushback ever. So mm -hmm. even if you got the 75 and if you felt that was an increase because you're already doing the work anyway, every time you have a client that go on a river cruise, might as well. Yeah. Um, leverage that. So. 
Well, um, I can't believe it. We've already chatted the hour away, and it's time to kind of roll into our final segment, which is our warm fuzzy segment. And yes, <laughs> there is actually a warm fuzzy um, segment on this podcast because, I mean, I'm involved, so of course there's like a warm fuzzy segment. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I was telling someone the other day how I was taking a walk around the neighborhood. It's fall here right now in Minnesota. And I was walking around the neighborhood and I love the smell of like fresh fallen leaves. And I love to like, I don't know, walk through piles of leaves. It's just a yeah. small joy of mine. So I'm walking and I'm, I'm with my two dogs and we're like on this cute little walk. And I'm, I see this like big pile of leaves on the sidewalk in front of me and I'm so excited. And I'm just zoned in on it. And I go in and I'm like stomping and I'm smiling and I'm, it's the middle of the day. So no one's really out. Except there was, there was this man in his yard, 10 feet away from me, that was like a, he was like above a retaining wall and a half fence, so I didn't really see him. And then all of a sudden, like, I heard this person laughing, and I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> I'm like, I just love the smell of leaves. And so, you know, that's why we have a warm fuzzy segment on here, because small things bring me small joys, large joys, actually. Absolutely. So, yeah. well, um. Larry, don't feel any pressure because we're in the middle of a pandemic um, and our industry is semi-collapsed. But do you have a warm fuzzy to lift everyone's spirit uh, as we wind down the episode? No pressure. Yeah, I mean, I think I touched on it a little bit earlier too, but I think that, you know, what brings me joy about what I do, especially in this pandemic, was the fact that the message I got back from my clients once the pandemic hit and I send them a message about the retainer and they pretty much all opted to keep paying me to this, uh, which has been amazing. You know, like I, I assume I had good clients, but it's really good to get that confirmation. People really care and really value what you do point where they're invested in your survival in a sense. And, um, you know, like, I feel like sometimes it's an opportunity our clients don't have is how we, how can I support you? There's nothing out there for me to support you on, right? I can't, I'm forced that people pay me a retainer. There's something. Uh, but as I mentioned in another, uh, from, I was like, well, you guys can sell services, sell a gift card, like restaurants do it, right? Because their patrons don't want the restaurant go. So I'm sure there's some advisors that have clients that don't want to see them go. But how would they give them money? There's there's nothing. There's no yeah. platform. There's nothing to do it. And if you say, listen, buy three hundred dollars worth of service, pay two hundred, and now you get money now, they're okay to delay the service till later, and it's cash for you now, and you can you can give the service later when you have other sources of income. Like that'd be a great way to do it. But you know, so that's a bit of a a good side of the retainer that I never thought about as an advantage is that because I have my clients on monthly retainers, perhaps. Hopefully we never see another pandemic like this, but other yeah. things that happen, I, I may still have a paycheck and I may still support uh, from my clients. So, uh, so that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And I, I had told you before we got onto the recording, but we had gotten an email from um, a client that wrote in and it was really sweet saying he had to cancel some of his cruises, um, that he was like 80 something years old. Um, and he wanted to, he knew that his travel advisor had put all this work into it but that now he had to cancel the cruises and he felt really bad and he wrote and he said, I came across your travel agent commissions article and wanted to know like how much commission my advisor is losing because I want to pay it out of pocket. And the, the man ended up like having a $40,000 worth of vacations that were ending up canceling. So he, the, we just told how much commission the agent probably would have made on average. And he paid that whole amount as like a quote unquote tip to the advisor. Mm -hmm. So that it's just super sweet, the kind of outpouring of support from uh, clients when they're able to. So. Uh, and this client, this good, this client reached out on his own, right? I'm sure there's a lot of clients, of clients that would do the same, but just don't reach out and don't have a way. So. Yeah. I mean, it was so jar. cute. I was like, an 80 year old man like going online searching like travel agent commissions and coming across our article and writing us like the the amount of work he went through was just it was just yeah. like heartwarming it was just adorable <laughs> um all right so well hot diggity we are wrapping things up so larry it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today i can't think of a better way than to have spent <laughs> my day with all of you so thanks for joining us 
Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And it's always great to talk fees and airfares anytime. Yeah. And, and don't forget to check out, um, for those that are listening, first of all, um, if you want to learn you know, more, more from Larry about all his airfare tricks, you can go to airfareconsultant.com slash slash H-A-R. Um, and um, for those of you that are listening, don't forget, we talked about our income reports uh, surveys last time, and now our income reports are actually out. So check them out on host agency reviews. Um, I'll give you a little teaser and let you know that the average income for the hosted agent that is full-time um, and has a few years under their belt. Uh, Larry, can you give me a drum roll, please? That's a very soft drum roll, but thank you. <laughs> okay, so it's over 64000 So it's up quite a bit from last year, which is really exciting. Um, and we've got lots more data where that's come from. So things like the median income for advisors, what was from, like how much came from consultation fees versus service fees. Um, what else is in there? What percentage of advisors earn over 100000 um, and lots, lots more. So visit hostagencyreviews.com slash blog. And uh, from the tag uh, drop down menu, you can select travel agent surveys and that will pull up all of our surveys. And that's all for now. We'll see you next time. You can watch a video, read a transcript, and view the show notes for today's show by visiting hostagencyreviews.com slash TAC and clicking on episode 17. Now's the perfect time to rethink your agency and make the changes you always wanted to do, but were too busy to do. We've got a free 16 page travel agency business plan template for you as you start to write down your thoughts. We'll guide you through the process and provide plenty of resources for you as you fill out the form. To download your free, free copy, visit hostagencyreviews.com and type business plan in the search bar. If you have any questions on today's show, jump over to Host Agency Review's YouTube channel and comment on the video and Larry or I will get back to you. Thanks for listening and stay safe.